Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Guitar Round podcast. This is episode number 145. I'm one of your co-hosts for this evening, David Beebe, and joining me tonight is Dan Smith. Hello. Dr. Jay Wilson. Hello. And the one and only Tom Quayle. Hello. How you doing, fellas? Everyone uh, feeling all right? Yeah, all right. Good, good. good. Mm. Um, just going to dive right into the housekeeping this week. I just want to say a huge thanks to the new Patreon signups. We've got James Davis and uh, Will Pusey uh, signed up for the Executive Producer Plus level. Um, thank you very much. Um, on that note, if you want to support the show and you love what we do from just $1 a week, you will get longer episodes, full-length interviews, the additional monthly Patreon bonus episodes, and the video live stream with guitars. <laughs> what are you doing, Jake? You're choking on your beer. Oh, it went, yeah, it went down the wrong hole. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, I just had one of those uh, risky, scary moments where you've got a mouthful. And you're risky, like, scary please, moment going down the wrong hole. Please don't go all over, <laughs> all over my equipment. In front of an expensive microphone. Yeah. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> other way, Luckily, I got away with it. Other ways that you could support the show are <laughs> oh, to check out our merch over on Teespring, uh, t shirts, stickers, mugs, all that good stuff. Um, leave us a rating review over on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Instagram, and send an email to hello at theguitarandpodcast.com and join in the discussion at the Facebook discussion group. We've got one new additional thing as well. Dan's been working hard getting these cool YouTube versions done, so the podcast is now on YouTube if you want to, uh, if you prefer to listen that way. Um, some fancy little um, audio animations. Uh, is that the right word? Audio animation? Is that even makes yeah, sense audio it's like audio spectrum it's just it's just what the name of it is but but i mean in my head i'm like well is anyone really going to watch it on youtube it's just somewhere else to have it isn't it you know it doesn't hurt say you're in a situation where you want it to come through your studio monitors or something you can yeah. just chuck it up on your you know chuck it up on youtube there and listen to it that way um, but yeah, I mean, eventually the plan will be to maybe have some other sorts of content on there. It doesn't hurt. Um, all of yeah. our live streams in the past have been unlisted, hosted, you know, on YouTube. So we've got the channel. So subscribe to us on YouTube. And um, yeah, if you want to just listen on there, you can now do that. Um, anything else to say? Hmm. I don't think there is. So let's just get into the show. I mean, uh, <laughs> what have you guys been up to? <laughs> Dan. Oh, do me first. <laughs> oh, no, you said do you last. You did. You, pro you proclaimed do, do, do me, me last, last, daddy. Do me last. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, blah, blah, blah. Oh, let's go with Jake. Right, you can tell this one's going to be uh, a slightly mischievous one. Uh, it's, there's, there's something <laughs> the in best. the air. Yeah, um, what have we been up to? I have been, well, obviously we're uh, into the second week of the national lockdown, and uh, yeah i'm just sort of practicing and writing and trying to stay sane really um feeling very tired lately you know it's kind of that wintry tired vibe uh need to make sure i get out during the day and get some sun but apart from that you know just practice and <laughs> composing every day <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and tom you've been uh, working on some crazy new uh techniques or sounds should i say <laughs> yeah I, actually today is the well last night was the first time i picked up a guitar in about two or three weeks um apart from a little a couple of videos here and there but i haven't done any videos on youtube recently because you and i've been very busy working on this app that's mm. going to be announced properly at the end of this month hopefully we'll see we'll see um but yeah i've been working on this wayne crancy kind of thing i don't know if it is a wayne crancy thing or not but it sounds wayne crancy to me there's, um, if anyone's ever heard Two Drink Minimum or any of the kind of live oh, albums, yeah. there's some ridiculous, crazy outside stuff that happens with some open strings that sounds very improvised. It's not licks at all. And I've got a recording session coming up with a bass player friend of mine, probably the person I've known the, the longest in my entire life who I'm still in touch with. And um, he's asking me to do some of this stuff and he was sent a video through and I was like, I can't do that. That's far too difficult. It's just very weird. So basically the idea is that you play out by incorporating um, two things. One is open strings because they just jut out from nowhere and kind of create this angular intervallic sound. And then you have to try and not outline anything, which is surprisingly difficult. You'd think that would be really easy, just wiggle your fingers. and. But the problem is you get so used to wiggling your fingers that they fall into a particular place on the guitar. Muscle memory. And you can't, you can't yeah, exactly. You can't wiggle your fingers in a different way. So it kind of sounds a little bit like this and I won't be able to do it now so it's like it's 
It's very angular, very weird, very cool. I really like the sound of it, but it's been surprisingly hard. It's taken a good few hours to get to the point where I can do that. And I've noticed patterns creeping in already, and that's kind of a big no-no. Mm. I've noticed this little kind of... Um... But it sounds very, it sounds very of the style. It's very of that kind of... Well, I don't know what you call it. Free, weird, hip... Heavy man, it's so heavy. You get free, so free much the hips. <laughs> you get so much mileage from the uh, the third, fourth, and uh, oh, it'll be all of those for you, isn't it? But the, uh, basically, those that are a tone or a semitone above or below the open strings, that seems to be where all of the kind of serious uh, angularity comes from. Wow, this is the interesting bit. So. Sorry to slightly hijack here, but I guess people will be a little bit interested. I haven't done it that way. So I haven't thought about that at all. I haven't thought about anything. What I've done is the same way I started initially practicing my legato technique, where I slowed everything down to the point where I was super in control of every single note choice and every single bit of the technique. And I've just been using my ears. And I've just found things that kind of work and found my fingers have fallen into a muscle memory rut now. So I can do this now and make it sound angular without having to think about it. So I just sat for ages like. Actually, the hardest thing and to do is to pull off the to the open string with the first finger. a tramp. Finger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I, you can't, you can't play a walking bass line and make it sound right for that stuff. Um, but still, it's very interesting and uh, been a big eye opener. And like I was saying to you guys before we started, the problem now I've got is that everything else. If I go, it sounds really twee and rubbish now. It's like, oh, there's too much harmony. <laughs> I need to be more out. So it's quite interesting how your ear really does mm. fall into a particular groove. That's a bad word to use. A particular kind of harmonic statement if you like which in this case is no harmonic statement and as soon as you hear a harmonic statement you're like oh that's a that's not that's not what i was going for so i've, become a, be... I've become a free snob now uh, <laughs> it might be cool to listen to some um stravinsky like the kind of right of spring era stravinsky and to to hear how he uses those kinds of chromatic sounds uh, really motivically and repetitively, and, and they they develop. But another guy who's like uses that kind of sound a lot is Mark Anthony Turnage. Uh, it's just these like I don't know how they're like they're almost loopy, you know. But they're not. They like develop. So like a typical Turnage thing might be yeah, you know that sort of thing. It's like yeah. I would be looking at that kind of thing if I was. See, that's the weird thing. So what I've been discovering is you can't really play things over and over again, even if they're slightly chromatic, because once you played them two or three times, they start to stay to harmonic area in your mind. Yeah, it's just finding that like ambiguity. Um, yeah, language. Like if you play. It starts to sound like something. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's got super into Ghostbusters. Oh, fantastic. That my <laughs> is that actually it? No, it's not quite, is it? But it's close. Yeah, it's close. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, but there you go. Exactly. So you start to repeat it and you will relate it back to something. It's got to be moving all the time. And the really hard thing that I found as well is there's two things. The first is the pull off from the first finger it's very rare in my playing that I ever pull off with my first finger. Um, it sounded rude for some reason. Um, and then the other thing that's really hard is to do it really well in time, to, to keep it really solid. And what you find is you get to the point where you can start wiggling your fingers and you start to be able to, to pick out certain accented parts of the, the beat. And that's where it becomes really interesting because you can start to really play with the time. Because all you're doing is playing constant streams of nonsense, 16th notes or whatever, or triplets. But you start to be able to pick out bits of the phrase rhythmically that you like. So mm. it's very cool. I suppose the, mm. the reason I brought um, the repertoire thing up was is, is kind of how do you make it significantly interesting for longer periods? And I know <laughs> I like can't. Krantz is, you know, a, a master of that. But I think even for a lot of people listening... There is a, 
there is a, such a sort of needle to thread with regard to how successful that stuff is over long periods. Yeah. Well, what he's he's doing on this video is he's talking about uh, inside and outside playing in terms of resolution. And he's, I think he's in, I don't know what he's in, B flat minor or something. Um, that B, You never hear Wayne Krantz play B flat minor like that. It's far too, far too in. Um, I don't know what you get, like a... That's what you get, isn't it? That kind of that's his B minor vibe. It's not yeah. like so you do have vocal Tom. Yeah. You are. I said you do have vocal after all that talk last week. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. I still don't understand what it is, but okay. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting discussion we could go down, but I don't want to. I don't want to derail it completely. But um, he's doing the kind of in, I can't do it yet, but he's doing the inside outside thing where he's playing very weird angular open string stuff, and then he resolves it in. And I can do it if I have a bass line, you know, keeping me grounded, but I can't do it. I couldn't do it for you now. Like if if I start playing, um, it just sounds rubbish when I resolve because it sounds too inside. But if you have a bass player laying down a groove, it sounds super cool because they've got this this solid thing. Especially if it's you know someone like Anthony Jackson or something, you know somebody like that. But it's not like if you practice playing outside on your own and you do the thing like I always teach it as a four bar drum fill and you just play something really outside and then you come back again. It sounds pretty cool. But with this stuff, it's so angular and so weird and so intervallically wide and, and bizarre that it's very hard to make it resolve properly without having a drummer and a bass player there as well. So, But anyway, I'd be intrigued to see if anybody in the audience wants to have a go at it. It'd be, it's, it's quite cool. Sorry, Dan. You know what it sounds like? Um, you know catchphrase? Uh oh, you know the oh, wall yeah, on catchphrase yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's like and then they press the button and then one of the squares goes away <laughs> this is very very niche for our worldwide audience like uh, how many people listening remember what was his name Bob no but don't they have Roy catchphrase it's they have catchphrase yeah. in the US Roy though Walker I think catchphrase yeah huh? pretty sure. I think they have catchphrase in, obviously it's a different presenter but I think they have catchphrase in the US Gimby. well they did have the same was it called something else though I don't no. know maybe not don't anyway. know. <laughs> but there you go. That's what I've been doing. Sorry, yeah, I always man. take ages. That's all right. Um, Sarah's cut my hair. Looks looks good. It's not. It's, it's bizarre. Which is uh, this is all I've been sort of psyching myself up to is because we're in lockdown part two and there's no uh, all the uh, all the uh, barbers and whatnot are closed. So um, it was looking a bit Mark Hamill from Star Wars, actually. It was looking pretty pretty awful. Yeah, I'd <laughs> say I shaved it off in March for lockdown one. And with a with a razor, pretty much, and then I had not cut it since until then. So it had just completely grown out through the microphone stages and into the wild Cape Man thing. And and as Tom mentioned, um, uh, we've been working extremely hard on this uh, app. Um, so uh, we've got tons and tons of filming to do for that this week. So um, I'm just trying to tidy myself tidy myself up a little bit. So I'm looking human. Um, other than that, yeah, I've just been. We're grabbing some moments here and there with the vocab thing, not the vocab, the, uh, the chromaticism, bebop thing. Um, and yeah, having some, still some great sex, <laughs> sexess. Um, oh, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> having some great suck <laughs> sex. It's just not just a haircut. <laughs> with, um, with old Bill. <laughs> and uh, yeah, say, I've, I've I thought it may have been a fluke for last week, but I've just, I've definitely got very early now, com like even the B section completely uh, <laughs> in my memory. So I'm quite chuffed about that. So um, what are you shaking your head for? Just uh, that whole, that whole thing that you just <laughs> that did, whole that whole room. skit was amazing. Well, I know what minute is uh, getting posted to Instagram this week. Oh <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, guys, follow us on Instagram as well. Cause Dan's been doing some like little uh, one minute hot uh, uh, promo clips. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that one was cool very well. hot. Yeah. Um, so Dan's uh, proclaimed, do me last, do me last. So this is a rude episode. What's going on? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, you know, the uh, I, th I think it was an Oscar Wilde quote. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but he said, uh, whenever I see a, uh, whenever I see an innuendo in my writing, I whip it out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. I like it. Amazing. Nice. Go on then, Dan. Hit us. Whip it out, Dan. Um, well, I've not. The thing is, I've not really. All I've really been doing is, um, is just teaching loads, um, which is it's fun. Well, teaching loads, and then obviously like 
doing these little visuals and stuff like podcast socials things um but there's a strange thing happening at the weekend because i'm teaching monday to friday now um which is fine and i'm not like you know i'm not begrudging it i'm not hating the teaching or anything like that i know a lot of people can go down that route um but it's it's fine i'm what i'm doing at a time like this is trying to invest in in all my commitments and all the things that i've got to do um and sort of do them as as best i can and not sort of like not let my head go astray if you like uh given that there's sort of no gigs and there's this slightly unbalanced lifestyle but when it gets to friday or saturday there's like a really weird like not like a sort of come down but there's like this kind of fog that descends because it's like you're not busy anymore and you, but you feel like you've you know you've only got a couple of days off before it starts again and there's like a real sort of strange lack of meaning that sort of happens kind of on a saturday it sort of passes by sunday and then it's like you're back into the week again but hmm. there's a, like a really odd thing going on sounds a little bit like you're experiencing maybe like the like the the working week is in because this is something that i guess many of us won't have done in a large sense is experience the working week like a like you know someone that does nine to five and has the weekend i don't know yeah i've got a uh, parton syndrome <laughs> all, uh... i mean you and i um, certainly down have been like for the longest time always the weekend is the busiest time isn't it so and it's like things have flipped yeah yeah yeah. it was more you know the, the teaching thing was just sort of mm. sort of a bit of a balance thing yeah but obviously now there's no gigs i've just said yes to a lot of things to keep going and i'm mm. I, i'm very aware of how lucky i am to have work given that so many people are out of work um but there's a really weird yeah. thing happening at weekend um friday i'm i'm usually like just my brain's usually pretty fried because it's uh i've got full days like thursday friday saturday so i'm probably teaching I don't know, maybe 60, 70 kids a week or something at the minute. Um, oh. Wow. So my brain's gone by Friday. Um, yeah. And then Saturday comes around and it's it's a weird thing. It's not like I'm not feeling like, uh, oh, you know, I really want to do this, but I haven't got any time to do it. It's more that there just isn't the kind of, the sort of excitement there to do anything. Like I say, the only way I can explain it is a sort of slight lack of meaning. It feels a bit sort of quiet, really quiet at the weekends. And then when you get back to it, it's like week. the weekdays are fine because you're just in and you're just rolling. You need a PlayStation 5. Yeah. I well, I was, <laughs> I was about to say, that it seems like there's a, um, there is a, a lot of work and a lack of reward. And because mm. of lockdown, you don't have a, uh, a, an immediate an way to reward yourself at the weekend, which is what, you know, people have been doing for uh you know since time in memoriam so it's it seems as though that you get to the weekend and then you're going okay yeah great oh okay let's just have a, another day <laughs> of nothing <laughs> yeah exactly and obviously there's there's like financial reward because you're doing a job and you're getting paid but it <clears> all <throat> just seems a bit odd at the moment yeah, what can it's you like use it the for all, all it's like all all bets are off the rules don't really make sense um it's a, stra it's a strange one it's a strange one this is probably the closest thing I've had to a nine to five, like ever. Yeah. And it's, um, it's quite, it's quite bizarre. I'm not begrudging anyone that, you know, does the sort of nine to five thing. It's just a very strange, very strange situation when it comes to the weekend. It's like, you feel like, shit, I better do something with my time, but I'm not motivated to really do anything. It's kind of. So, so how much guitar playing are you doing when you're not, cause obviously you're doing a lot of teaching. Are you finding your guitar playing is. Zero man. Zero. I'm not touching Zero. It. Yeah. Um, just, you know, I had a bit of a, um, while I was waiting for a student today, I'd opened this little Beatles real book thing that I've got. Oh, I've got and that I was well. just playing around with a little, I was just trying to just sort of read a tune and just like sort of solo melody, just just kind of, you know, do the puzzle. So sort of, that's like my version of a crossword <laughs> um, to be able to just sit there, and, you know, sit there and do it. I did that and that was quite, you know, I got a little mini, oh, that was enjoyable. But that's, you know, that was only like 10 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, this but, um, is this whole situation is um, extremely difficult to, you know, you're continually finding new ways to wrap your head around it. Um, I mean, the days have become, it's almost become a bit um, groundhog day. I don't, I mean, I know you were back in schools, Dan, but I'm, I'm actually not. I am doing some school teaching, but it's still remote. Um, 
and what I've been finding is, and I'm sure we'll get into this more when we sort of talk about this formally with the app stuff, is that I've just been working, well, both Tom and I have been working insane hours on this this project. And it's one thing that has been uh, a very, it's, it's been an incredibly productive time, but like also pretty, um, because there is no end to, you know, the day and I'm at home all the time, it's just you know, deeply in, in, engrossed in something. It's uh, pretty hard to take, take a break. And there's no, because I can't even really go out the house, I can't really... You know, you can go to the shop, I guess, for super supermarket, but it's just a weird, um, just kind of like work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep. It's just, yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not, it's not particularly good for you yeah, um, to do that because weird. you, you don't get, you, you as, as a human being, you can't really exist on on what this sounds a bit sort of meta, but you can't really exist on one plane. You have to have some variety in your life, and that's one of the things that's very difficult about lockdown. So. Yeah. One of the things that I miss a lot that I never thought I would, and I've said this on the podcast many times now, because obviously we're nine, well, however many months in now. Uh, although it's bizarre, actually, I was thinking about this. I met a friend of mine who I've not seen for ages since lockdown started in March. Um, I just saw them randomly on the street, and we were sort of stood two metres apart talking to each other, and they're shielding. So wow. mm. I was really making sure I didn't go near them. And we were saying, actually, it's bizarre how, if you think about it, it's gone quite quick, which yeah. is not to diminish any you know any of how difficult it's been because it's been for a lot of people it's been really difficult i mean i'm very lucky it's it's not been a massive change for me but i really really miss traveling because the headspace that you get into like there's something very healthy about going and especially for, as a musician you're a different person when you're on stage and you're a different person mm. when you are traveling you're a different person because you're in that mindset that performance mindset the person that's on stage is the person also i find who's traveling especially when you go away for yeah. a tour or when you go away for you know you're not going away on holiday you're going away for work it never feels like work to me but um that side of me myself i miss quite a lot and um it that's very healthy to have that so that you can exist in two different planes or two different worlds um, you don't get stuck in a rut with one of these different, you know, parts of your personality. I'm not saying I have multiple personality disorder, by the way. <laughs> you remind me of um, something from the other day, which I thought was quite um, important. Uh, the other day, it was my birthday, and we had a Zoom hangout. Oh, that was nice. And uh, it was really good fun. But one of the interesting things was it, it occurred to me that I actually haven't, like, met many new people <laughs> at all. And mm. there is something... There was something about, like, because I had friends from different walks of life in the Zoom uh, piss-up, basically. <laughs> um, it, it was something really nice about having people who had never met each other before. And I was thinking at the time, that that's something that I've really sort of missed about this whole mm. period, yeah. especially musicians, you know. It's, uh, it's, well, one it's of about this time of year we, we, we're sort of gearing up thinking about the January jaunt and it's not as uh, that's the first time it's not happening um for in the history when is it 30 years maybe that nam is not going on um and yeah i mean that is always a case of like meeting new people i mean you can't not so i guess go and do that sort of thing and, and not meet new people and within the same sphere of um interest that you know um yeah it's, it's a strange one um that but I just feel continually, um, I, I think with my mind, my sort of character and I can get very obsessed with things and that can be a really good thing and also quite a, neg a, 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 bad, th a bad thing as well. So, um, so, it's, it's, so in some ways, I mean, I'm being extremely productive, um, but at, also at the expense of just my health. <laughs> so yeah, I've got to yeah. try to take a breather and try and uh, yeah, remind myself to not. I, I need to make a quick correction. Um, I I did that classic thing of misattributing a quote to uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh. It was Kenneth Williams. <laughs> oh. That sounds more appropriate. Yeah, yeah it sounds yeah, more yeah, like yeah. it. <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Your um it. your birthday thing, Jake, was I was thinking about this uh, sort of the day after. Is like probably the the most probably the most social thing I've done in like probably this year. Same because it was everybody the social so many apart from Nam so many people there and everyone was like super nice and really kind of instant uh you know everybody sort of instantly respected 
each other and like you know and got the zoom thing yeah as well. yeah like, it was that's always weird. really up for it it was it was amazing having not had that this process happen for months and months and months that process of where a, where a conversation goes from polite respect to oh now the bants is starting because everybody's on the same level now so everybody's taking the you know the piss out of each other we've done the small talk and it's great now it's it's time what, to... yeah it's it's you don't get to experience that very much these days because Zoom the only needs a, needs a needs a chat roulette feature. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> terrible idea! <laughs> <laughs> there's some uh, there's some uh, TGH uh, YouTube content right there. <laughs> Starts hanging out on Omegle or whatever it's called. <laughs> oh no, I feel uh, old now. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so Jake, what's the uh, what's the topic then this week? Okay, so we didn't have a topic <laughs> earlier. Um, but we actually maybe struck a bit of gold. Um, I think this might be a nice uh, feature, you know, for a kind of uh, regular chat about stuff. Um, the overall idea is, do I really need to work on or learn X? And in the X bit, we talk about something that, um, you know, might be difficult or um, it's considered necessary or, or you know a particular yeah a particular thing and we talk about maybe what you might get from working on it what we've experienced through working on those things um you know maybe even what you won't get from it and that's uh and it's just a, a vehicle for discussion about things uh, related to particular points of practice mm -hmm. and um the other day i was doing a live stream i've been doing more live streams on instagram it seems to sort of take an hour out of an otherwise uneventful evening <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so i um so i did one the other day and uh, uh senor quail uh joined for the uh for a chat and i was working on giant steps and um giant steps is the subject of today's do i really need to work on giant steps <laughs> it was very cool steps, actually because um sorry dan go on oh i was just echoing the word steps in a oh <laughs> sorry and i ruined it manner. i do apologize um yeah it was cool because um you'd been working on it a little bit and sort of talking about how difficult it was and i was watching casually i just thought oh jake's gone live i'll just stick it on and um gerald's very good my partner, she doesn't mind when I get you guys on live stream, even if she's watching something because it's you guys, so she's fine. And I was watching, I was thinking, oh my God, what's happened? Like, I mean, you, sound, you always sound great, Jake, but actually the first video I ever heard you play on was, was you playing Giant Steps, looking about 12 years old in a Berkeley. <laughs> oh, that's the first video, video I, think, I saw of Jake as well, I think. Get it However, this, this, the playing you were doing on the live stream. Links in the show notes. <laughs> oh yes, amazing. The playing you were doing on the live stream was, was really great because it was you were actually playing uh, melodies and lines through the changes as opposed to just kind of coping with the changes, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Totally. You know, you can cope with the changes. You can just be like, <gasps> I'm, yeah. I'm getting there, I'm getting I'm doing it. And you don't sound wrong, but you're not playing anything except making your way through the changes just on the, you know, by the skin of your teeth. But you were playing these really great, cool sounding lines. So I was like, I've got to get in on this. I've got to ask him what he's been practicing. Um, You've been, you've been doing some specific things, I think, in terms of common mm. tones and uh, you're the same. You did a video on this, didn't you, on YouTube, where you were talking about your approach to playing over changes. Exactly, it's, it's the same. It's the same philosophy, at very least. Even if with giant steps, I'm slightly thinking of the particulars of that tune, but the idea has always been, for me, that there is a uh, there. Is, you are moving from one harmonic field to another. And in that movement, there is a kind of transfer of energy. And the way you manage that energy to communicate the change in harmony is what makes, for me, music make sense and sound beautiful and controlled. So I like to vo almost voice lead between the changes. And that, that way of working on things definitely lends itself to that that type of uh, type of thing, but I think we need to backtrack a little bit because yeah. why work on giant steps at all? Because it seems like a bit of a it seems like a bit of a sort of bravado thing of like yeah, trying that's to the work reason, on. Dude. 
uh, giant steps at this like you know horrible tempo. Um, well, even backtrack one step before that, even because obviously the audience to the podcast is so diverse. But Jake, give us sixty seconds. What is giant steps? A giant steps. Um, Sell is, giant steps in sixty seconds. Okay, to, giant to, steps to any prog guys or whatever that might not know. <laughs> You've just taken up twenty seconds of his time. <laughs> okay, right. I'll start. So, giant steps written by John Coltrane, Con Joel Crane, um, written by John Coltrane um, from the album of the same name. And it is peculiar in that it's very fast and it moves between unusual for the time um, harmonic centers or tonal centers. Um, I, I could be fluffing the, the theory, but the first move is indicative of the harmony. It moves from a, a B major seven to a D seven. Um, there is, of course, two, five, one action, but the general gist is that we, you're moving between like different islands of harmony, but there is a there is a certain amount of symmetry to it, based on I suppose the sort of the cycle of uh, uh, descending major thirds. I'll put the chord chart in the uh, podcast artwork now. If you guys want to just check that out, or obviously you can just Google it. But um, it's, it's so, basically um, a jazz tough mudder, but you don't win a headband at the end for completing it. <laughs> Well, it's one of the many, yeah, one of the many tough mothers in jazz. Like an orange beret at the end. <laughs> but I, yeah. I'd always, I'd always uh, cowered from it, and I've never had an opportunity to play it live. But, you know, when you've got these lockdown stretches, those kinds of projects, like, they speak to me. It's an interesting <laughs> tune in that it's, um, it's one of those that seems to be that, I mean, I may just, okay, may, I'm, I was backtracked, right to the beginning to assume that nobody somebody might not know what it is this is like memento it is <laughs> one of those like... tunes like so what or take five that almost any even non-musician might might know and certainly most guitar players will have at least heard of the the, 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 the jazz tunes very difficult tune giant steps um and i mean maybe before we talk about like why you might want to learn it, what makes it um difficult other than just the tempo i think is this idea of um we've talked many times on the podcast about uh, functional harmony and uh the kind of bebop era and this kind of songbook and i think one of the things that makes it extremely difficult is this abrupt shift in nature of different keys that you can't or it's very difficult to, to just using your ear um navigate that um, in a way that you perhaps can with more blues-based material or rhythm changes, um, and I think that give and then couple that with the tempo, it results in a, a quite a, a, a difficult thing to traverse. And I think that has become, um, and because of that, I think at the times it was. I mean, the sessions for the album were in 1959. It was released in 60, 1960. But um, yeah, it, it's it's one of those one of those things that has become like this. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of, like a sort of a, a, a jazz nemesis that needs to be needs to be conquered um, by anyone that's a final boss. You know, a, 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 yeah, final boss. A, you know, anyone that wants to tackle the jazz mountain seriously, it seems to be something that you've got to have under your belt at some point. Um, but even to non-jazz guitarists or jazz, non-jazz musicians, it seems to be this you know terrifying fabled thing that is extremely complex to do and um and i think maybe that's maybe that's why um it's, i don't know do it, you guys have any other thoughts on why why it's so difficult or why it's perceived to be so difficult I, th I think it's the the way the the way the chords move the way the harmony moves just the way the tune moves the way things land the sort of phrasing of it um it's just so different than anything else if you've got a real book on a jazz gig and then they're like right calling tunes it's so different to to anything else that you might get in there really it's like it's its own thing and it's almost like you have to play over it using it's like you're in its world and you have to play over it that way you can't yeah, really think, you know any of your, your standard kind of vocab if you like it's not it will work but it's like there's not enough time, you know. Well, that's what I mean about your ear. You, yeah, you can't, you can't like with the rhythm changes. Like if someone's quite gifted with their ear, you can kind of, you can square that circle of your, you know, material or whatever into 
um, you know, I, I think it's it's the it's where the limits of someone who's not a super freak might break down at something like Giant Steps to being able to kind of like blow over that without you know doing any kind of pre shedding. And even um, it famously, of course, the Tommy Flanagan take that was used on the original. There was many, many. I mean, there's there's about eight takes in the sessions, and I've listened to them all today in preparation, so you guys don't have to. Um, and it's it's quite interesting to listen to all the various takes that that, that, we, that was done and at different tempos and there was different people on uh, kit and piano at various points and the take that they used uh, was Tommy Flanagan and uh, obviously this was presumably the Coltrane's preferred take but when Tommy gets to take his solo it's it's famously this um, it's become the, the stuff of memes and legend now where he he has this very sparse um, stop start um, solo over it. Um, that's some of the background to it, yeah. So to fast forward back into what we were talking about at the uh, the beginning of the conversation, um, I, I think that there's the tendency we have with this stuff is to think really in terms of scales. And when you have like four notes to play to spell out a, a B major seven, then your choice of notes then becomes quite critical in my view, in my ears, I mean, I'm sure there's a modal approach which sounds great, but for me, I do like to hear those important kind of characteristics come out. That sounds to me like someone who's in control of the harmony. And then I like to scale things back. Uh, a really fun exercise is to sort of try to play as little as you can and still still get across the main aspects of the harmony. And a lot of people will find those things to be uh, the, you know, the, the thirds and sevenths, that idea. That works if, so, if you've got some other people playing with you. But if you're playing on your own, sometimes you've got to be a bit more abstract and that's where the ear kicks in. There's obviously other problems like, you know, your fretboard knowledge will be tested to the extreme on this stuff. Um, not necessarily, you know, I don't think you're going to need to know your um Locrian natural twos for example but you will absolutely be able uh, be having to play lots of two five ones and lots of um you know very quickly uh shifting major harmony so there's this thing of you're never really settled in the harmony it's always shifting beneath your th your feet and so your brain power is just kind of overclocking the whole time yeah, there's a, a major technical issue as well involved in that when you play over, this relates back to what Bibi was saying, when you play over a Rhythm Changes or when you play over, I don't know, um, Days of Wine and Roses or Stella, or, they're, they're all related functionally, as Bibi was saying, to a particular key. So you do a Rhythm Changes in B flat. There's a lot of um, vocabulary which is based around particular fingerings, around particular, like you hear people play, if, if, if somebody's got... Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of blues phrasing goes on with giant steps one of the problems people come across is that there is a fingering issue in that the key changes happen so frequently in some cases like the first measure has a key change in from b major to g major it's the 5 of g major just the fingering that's required to negotiate those two keys is very difficult in terms of you're not guitar players particularly are not used to negotiating two keys that quickly. Well, Whilst lazy playing first fingers go to die. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually one of the reasons why you know, if we get onto this, maybe why you would want to learn giant steps is there was a very good. It's, it's funny that you were saying you've never played it live, Jay. This is a tune I would never, ever play live uh, unless it was a mid-tempo or Pat Metheny-esque bosser. And that isn't because I can't play over it. It's because even I find it boring to play over that tune at very high tempos and remain interesting enough that I, I would get that horrible thing where you start to wonder whether you're being over the top and self-satisfying instead of playing something that the audience are going to have anything to relate to. The only time I would ever play that tune and the only time I ever have played that tune in front of an audience is if it's requested on a clinic 
because it's like do the thing over giant steps oh. and then you know that you can do it for like 10 choruses and people are going to be like why yay but i would never do it on a gig not in a million years unless it was a mid-tempo thing where you could really be creative over it and you know you listen to the original coltrane version it's like you know it's cool but i don't think you'd want to hear him play th- like he was famous for taking incredibly long solos. You wouldn't want to hear him play f- for 10 minutes on that. You know, whereas on the Love Supreme, you'd be quite happy to hear him play for 10, 15 minutes and it's pretty remarkable. I, I, that's, I couldn't think, I couldn't be any more back to front on that. You're kidding me. Maybe it's just where my head's at with how obsessed I am with wanting to crack this nut. But I think, yeah, maybe, maybe, I think maybe that gets us into an interesting point on the tune itself in that it has this... Um, duality of um, it has probably equal um, reverence and praise with its sort of critical aspect of it as well for that reason so I often hear people talk about it being you know it's just not a dec- it's not a nice melodic tune it's just not very interesting in general so, yeah. it's, not, it's not a great tune is it <laughs> I mean so I mean what about the things that um you, we have all done then in this regard on this. So, um, and in terms of what the benefits that you, we may have sort of derived from it, Jake, you're, I guess you're working on it now. You, you did quite a bit in your July mega practice session, didn't you, as well? So do you feel coming back to it now, some of that stuff has um, lingered and in terms of the gains that you made on it back then in July are sort of noticeable now when you're tackling it? You, yeah, sent, you sent us a backing track to a 280, sorry, a 280 BPM version of it, saying it's sort of, this is your... We're all going to play challenge. over it in a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, uh, so I guess I haven't really stopped working on it. Um, oh, nice. I, I don't really play jazz, right? I'm not really a jazz guitarist. I, I But I'm super interested in harmony, and I love the sound of you know, shifting tonalities and all that kind of thing. I also like the Sudoku-esque puzzle of something like mm, uh, Giant Step. So there is an element of it which is, oh, you can just kind of, you know, program your brain to do these things, so I might as well do it. And um, the the tough thing, really, as Tom alluded to earlier, has been trying to make it musical. And... Um, I got to a point relatively quickly um, where I could kind of blow over it um, with a kind of, you know, moto perpetuo constant stream of notes for, uh, you know, a couple of choruses, make a mistake, a couple of choruses. But I would fall behind on the time or my technique would be awkward or I'd have to sort of do a weird thing or you know there would be there'd be fluff in it um that fluff has gradually been sort of easing its way out so now it's kind of maybe four or five choruses zan's fluff um but th- that's kind of an exercise that's not music and then when i got bored with that because like there's that wayne Krantz quote from the interview we did with him you know whatever you're practicing just don't let it be boring and I, I really took that to heart. And so I just keep making these little challenges for myself. And they're all challenges I've done with other things. You know, I could play the blues this way. Um, but the idea being is, uh, I mentioned it earlier, try to spell out the harmony using extremely selective information. Try to um, play all in a, a very local box in, on the fretboard. Uh, try to motivically connect everything try to uh, like only play in groups of five, you know, uh, not like quintuplets, but melodic statements that contain five accents. Um, so all that stuff I've been sort of, you know, all the limitation exercises I've been working on, so that when it comes to actually playing over it, there is an element to which I feel there's been some success uh, to making it musical because there is a kind of um, there is a, a a way to negotiate those uh, <laughs> you know the the shifting sands of giant steps um, and and to logically 
move from one tonality to the other. And I think that the one of the one of the, I mean I'm going on a bit here, sorry. One of the really cool things to do is if you just find yourself in a corner rather than to quickly move to the next uh, nearest note, which might be a bad one, is to just completely start a new thing. As long mm. as you don't as long as you don't do that too many times, I think it sounds pretty good. It's it's one of those tunes actually that um I think people th- there is a perception and it's it's correct in many ways that you need to be very specific with what you play on this tune. But you can approach it in a very different way. And I think this is a very useful thing that I've found from playing this tune is to be slightly more abstract. Because the thing to remember with giant steps is that the bass line is really, really, it's not traditional strong harmony all the time. It doesn't always move by a semitone or by fourths and fifths. But there's a lot of that going on. But it's very strong because it outlines those three tonalities really, really, really well. So Sorry, very quickly there, Tom. That's actually very interesting that Coltrane, the name Giant Steps was named after the bass line. In the, oh, there we go. His quote was that it's not moving by fourths and semitones. That's in terms of it's more of a loping sort of a thing. Yeah. So that's it. But the bass line, if you think about... <laughs> It's very, cl- it's very clear and easy to hear, and like when you've got used to it, it defines. You don't need anything else in there to define the harmony. It's very, very two five one two five one. You know, it's very straight ahead, kind of easy harmony. But you can do a lot with it. So one of the things I used to practice, I haven't done for ages actually, was taking a structure. So I might take this structure, for instance, for B. <laughs> And then you take that structure and you move it to fit for every single chord. And actually, when you do it in isolation, it sounds, it's not abstract, but it makes giant steps sound quite interesting. So you can have like, oh, sorry, the wrong, wrong harmony. Uh, and then. And then. So if I do this out of. Uh, You can sort of hear the harmony going by in the background, but I'm not playing. You know, it's not really obvious harmony. It's a bit more open sounding because they, they were like sus chord structures. And there's, I think by doing some of that stuff where you move slightly more abstract sounding stuff around, you can learn a lot about the fretboard, a huge amount that you wouldn't necessarily see if you were just mapping out those classic Coltrane structures of one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, one, two, three, five, over and over and over again. Um, or if you were just playing chord tones, you can you can do a lot with it. 26-2 is another good tune to do this on, obviously, because it's a similar sort of setup. Um, but that's a really nice way to learn some things about the fretboard that you maybe wouldn't have found any other way. It's interesting. I was um, talking to uh, John Cordy, uh, YouTube and um, fantastic guitar player I've mentioned before, about uh, Coltrane stuff. And... He was saying how he really dislikes, he kind of really dislikes John Steps for, but I He's a Central in, Park West guy. Say again? Oh, it was you that did this, right? Well, oh, what was that? I said a Central Park West, but it was you that did this. I told him about that. So I said, check out Central Park West, because obviously that's, uh, it's, a ball- it's a ballad and it's gorgeous. You know, it's, it's not moving in exactly the same um, major third structures, but it's really, really nice. Um, but anyway, he's kind of went through this journey of like really digging Central Park West and then um, some more of the ballady versions of uh, Giant Steps. And there's, there's, if you guys are interested in, there's, um, uh, <laughs> I always think of this as recent because it was, came out when I was at college, uh, but it's like 20 years old now. <laughs> so it's the Pat Metheny, uh, I always forget whether it's, it's on the both the live and the studio version, but it's the trio, Tom, help me out. Zero, 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 one. Yeah. No, no, 9900 or 0001. I can't remember which yeah. way around it is. Anyway, there's, there's two Pat Metheny albums with the trios in, in 99 era. And yeah, he does a sort of a, I think maybe was he one of the first guys to do that? Like a mm-hmm. chilled out version of Giant Steps. Um, and I think it can take on a whole new life in different contexts. Um, I know, Tom, you'd done a sort of a ballad, really beautiful sort of ballady kind of re, not re harm, but like a, uh, sort of arrangement, this, but not really. Yeah. yeah, that's just really, really nice that we've played a few times. Um, so you can do some really cool, interesting things with it, and I think it can, um, it can illuminate different corners of that of that particular um, 
This is the thing. What I was talking about earlier in terms of the being slightly more abstract, that takes on a whole new meaning when you play it slowly because you've got a lot more time to explore each chord. I think one of the other reasons why you might want to learn this tune and actually try and play it at a faster tempo is because it teaches you to be very economical with what you play. It's sort of alluding to what Jake was talking about before. You have to be really, really surprisingly in control of your note choice. Because you, I, I remember speaking to, I won't sort of say who this, this was, but I remember having a conversation with another guitar player, a really great guitar player, who can play this tune really well. And they were sort of talking about the fact that they think about this tune in terms of the three major keys, and they, they just play in the major key that's relevant at the time. But the thing is, when you play really fast on this tune, you can't really do that. You have to think very vertically all the time, I find, anyway. And it's a really, really good tune for learning how to do two things. One is be very economical, and the second is you have to, have to, have to think ahead on this tune. You cannot play giant steps if you're thinking about the chord that you're on. Mm. It's just not going to work because they're going by too quickly. You have to really be able to visualize like one or two chords ahead, if not more. Um, do, do you do you do that, Jake, when you're playing over this tune? Do you um, think in that way? Yeah, the experience is that thing of um, it's a bit like a bouncing ball or something where you're you're in, but by the time you're in, you're already going somewhere else. You know, it's uh, it's so the ball's it, only hitting the floor for a split second before it's bouncing up again. Exactly, that's it. And that floor Beautiful is metaphor. kind of beat, beat one of um, beat one of the bar, if you like, um, mm. and. Obviously, you know, there's the kind of descent into beat one and then there's the bounce out of it because that's going to a new chord again. This is mainly in reference to the, like, let's call it the A section, the first eight bars. Yes. Right, because the second eight bars, it kind of, it almost half times the uh, the first eight bars. It writes itself in a way that is slightly easier to um, <clears throat> to tackle. Totally. Um, it's more 2 5 one -y. Well, it, yeah, it is literally, but um, the 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 first, I guess, bar one, two, and five and six are the real the real bastard, aren't they? They're they're just so gnarly to get your fingers around. As Tom was alluding to the technique and how just blindingly fast those shifts are made. But I think the localized nature of um, how you see. Uh, again, like, because one back on my uh, decision to kind of tackle jazz again and in a serious way, I mean, I, what, I w wasn't Giant Steps, but one of the tunes that would just hit me in the face every time I sort of opened the real book was 26-2. So I spent a hell of a lot of time on that one before Giant Steps, just because it was the first one in the book. <laughs> I was going to say, you load up iReal Pro, yeah, yeah. his favorite app, and it's the first thing that goes there. It's like, <laughs> I'll just learn that one. Well, so I've got this image. That won't be hard. Like, it's the first this, one. It won't be hard. I've got this kind of like Family Guy style, you know, when they sort of like uh, drop some sort of <laughs> metaphor or story and then it jumps away to like a visualization of it. I've got this image of you like sliding into Jazz's DMs. It's like, it's take me back kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, that, but that was um, this, it was the thing that made me realize, well, like connecting the dots here is going to be like, if I have to think of these large, large patterns and structures all the time. I'm never going to be able to navigate. I'm never going to be able to do this. So the that localized um, uh, aspect of, of that, uh, I think Tom and Jake, you were talking about this last week in the difference between how you might see that see the neck is that the um, I c I just was never able to make sense of all that information and be able to sort of thread the needle of the playing through a change as opposed to just on top of it because I think if you're playing on top of each chord change it's just never going to happen I think you, you have to be able to see on the fretboard uh, the third of the the third of the B major falling to the root of the D or um, yeah. you've got to see that locally enough and in, in be in control of that because if you have to sort of reset your brain to some big large shape each time on each top of each chord it's just I think that is just never going to happen it's kind of superimposition -y, isn't it you're kind of always thinking about how each tendency tone wants to go while you're yeah. in the harmony um dan have, have you ever dipped your toe in you know? pretty sure you and i have played this tune before dan 
pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, it's one of those. Back in the day. It's, um, it is a tune that I have probably, lo- I've not spent loads of time with it, but it is a tune that I've looked at as like, um, almost like, like you say, like the sort of Tough mother thing, um, like uh, an exercise in fretboard knowledge, really, as like a real, it's almost yeah, like, yeah. it's like your, it's like your sort of final exam for fretboard knowledge, if you like, because all, you know, you, you, you can fall into your little tricks and little, your sort of go-to bits of connecting tissue, if you like, for two, five, ones and things. Because like I said before, uh, it's so different than everything else. You'll, there'll be some tunes that I remember uh, somebody called Have You Met Miss Jones, I think. Mm-hmm. He's a sax player um, on a ship once. And he was talking about the A section and he said the A section plays itself. And I think by that he meant that it's a the kind of progression that you will see in that A section is similar to various other tunes. And I've heard of somebody sort of theorise that, you know, there's only like six chord progressions in most common jazz standards. And if you kind of get your head around those in all keys, you're pretty set. But this is completely different than that. Um, So in terms of that kind of, you know, a fretboard uh, knowledge exercise, I've used it for that. And it it has been called once on a ship as a bit of a joke. Uh, We've played it on a live stream a while back. Um, and I, I was just like, oh, okay, I'll just try. And there was that sort of like burst of like sort of getting it and then like <laughs> having to sort of take a minute to get my head together where I am and then like a little burst again and a little, um, but yeah, it's not one that I've, that I've obsessed over. The, the, what, I mean, a question is, and this is absolutely not, uh, shitting on Papa Coltrane, but is it, Given what when it came out and the sort of you know critical kind of response to it when it when it came out and given what was going on around it, like is it is it sort of still is it still relevant other than a kind of roast? Do you know what I mean? You know, there's certain things, there's like certain guitar things mm. that are like these big achievements. Like if you can play that, or if you can play that certain solo, but it's is it you know like getting back to you know should you learn it is like is it what are the main takeaways from it i, I think if you're, I mean? a ja- if, if you're an aspiring jazz guitarist or a jazz musician yes i think you should be able to play it okay for what reason because it's part of the, the well this for the same reason that you should be able to play stellar or all the things you are or blue bossa i think they're it's a little part, bit different part, part of the reason is that yes is it, what, what, part, part what of is the that reason then it's part of the canon it's part of the genre it's it's a it's one of the most classic and famous standards that's ever been written. But yeah. with all the things or stellar, you will find the, the the reason you might learn those is because they are well, obviously they're beautiful classic tunes, but they are reusable pieces of information that you will have tangible benefit for in many many other things. Like Dan was saying there about you know there only being whatever how many chord progressions. I think it it being its own little thing is there something and i'm just being obviously you know i agree with you but i'm just being a devil's advocate like is there a well it's not it's not its own little thing it's a it's a huge part of jazz harmony coltrane changes <clears> can be used in like it, it, it's not that you just learn it on giant steps in 26 2 and then you never use it again you can use coltrane changes on everything you can reharmonize standards reharmonize blues you can you, you can, can do but so it much, ends up just as a comp- like that though it ends up it has of course it does. sound yeah but that's all right i mean if you I've rarely been convinced by any Coltrane reharms. I, I have to say, sorry, you've never been convinced been by any Coltrane reharms. You say, yeah. Whenever I've heard them, I've been like, yeah. Well, that's kind of where, where I was kind of going with it. In that, is it, and as necessary as say, like if you are an aspiring jazz guitar player, other than the roast aspect of cutting, of being able to put your your badge on, being able to yeah. hang. Um, <laughs> no, I think you're doing it down. I I, I really do. I think it's a a very important piece of jazz history and harmony that that teaches you a great deal and i realize you were saying you were playing devil's advocate but it was you that said it so oh yeah i I have by the way i i this is one of my favorite things in the world to do i've spent hundreds of hours (laughs) at this point working on this puzzle and i but if if you take if you take the personal obsession out of it i still think it's vitally important for all jazz musicians to be able to play over this this harmony Hmm. okay that's not i'm not as convinced by necessarily, but um, 
Well, I mean, I don't from, see... Uh, the guitar angle, yes, from a guitar player's angle, yes. No, I'm not but talking about did that. say that. But even just from a... a mm, yeah, interesting. I was merely merely wondering, like, is it you know, is it is it relevant? I wasn't like so irrelevant a Coltrane, you know, even have a you, TikTok. <laughs> you you know. put the scatum on the pigeons here, Dan. <laughs> hey. So well, yeah, well, how do we how do we wrap that one up? Do we weird, do we maybe want to you know well, potentially provide? I know we don't really do answers as such on the podcast. It's mainly just loads of uh, kind of ramblings and then we're just asking questions we're just asking questions yeah exactly just just uh, you know just uh, how about this guys i really wish i could do an alex jones um is should you you know should should you should you learn it you know what what are the potential <laughs> takeaways from yeah you should definitely learn it from absolutely. learning it like what is absolutely should learn it obviously fretboard knowledge is one of them there are, i think look, um what you were saying about note choice would be very interesting because if you're max going to play four notes per chord, if you like, for us mere mortals anyway, then it's like first one's probably going to be a chord tone, the last one's probably going to be something that needs to lead to the next chord. So you've got two notes really <laughs> to, to play with in between that. That I've got to get you from one to the other. I mean, there's there's zero downside to learning. I know that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about what you get out of it, but there's zero downside to learning giant steps. And and don't. Like, if you're going to learn it because it's an ego cutting contest, that's also a good reason in my mind to learn it because it will push you and make you and, stress and us. Co- you know, drive you to play things that you couldn't play before. Mm. It will make you listen to new things. It will make you explore different standards. You know, the, the ego in of itself is not a bad thing. It's when the ego pushes you in the wrong direction that it can be. You mm. need some ego. And Giant Steps is a very good vehicle for ego but what i found with giant steps is that vehicle for ego turned into something that was quite an obsessive harmonic exploration outside of that egotistical starting point one thing i would say here finally on this for me is that um again just speaking to the audience that might not be jazzers already is that when we say by learning giant steps we don't mean uh going and learning the, the, yeah going and learning the melody and then copying the solo and being able to play that sort of thing note for note. You may do that, and that would be a very good exercise in and of itself for many different reasons. But what we're talking about here is being able to have the the real-time manipulable skill set of being able to improvise, uh, imp- you know, play over through the changes and be in control of those. Um, just to some clarity there. Um, That's a good point, actually. And I would just point out, for people in a similar boat, it's probably not the best tune to start with if you haven't done a lot of two five one work, um, because uh, you're going to find yourself uh, frustrated and not enjoying the journey. Because there, I think there are a few. Uh, I'll borrow Dave's phrase: there are a few core minimal skill set things which right. you, need, you might need to have before you uh, plunge into it and enjoy it. I actually am going to rail against that. Ooh. Uh, let no, me try and ex- said, let me try I, and explain as I why. I said it. I thought, well, there's no reason why. Well, let me try and explain yeah. why. If you are playing all the things you are, or if you are playing, you you name it, blue bossa, you know, you you pick the tune that's got two fives in it. It's a, a very steady tempo. You know, it's a medium swing. You've got to play a lot more notes, and you've got to cover a lot more ground. You've got to play a lot more vocabulary. Now, if you are just starting out with, forget the tempo, but if you are just starting out with uh, mapping harmony on the fretboard in a basic way, this tune is easier than Autumn Leaves. Because on Autumn Leaves, you have altered scale harmony, you've got some harmonic minor harmony if you approach it that way, you've got minor seven flat five chords, you've got minor seven chords, you've got dominant seventh chords, you've got... Um, Good point. You've got dual function chords. This tune has Mm, three chord types and they never function in any other way than two, five, and one. And the five chords, realistically, when you're playing over this tune, you never play, you might play a flat nine maybe, if that. Most people don't. Um, You know, nobody's going to be playing, nobody starting on this tune is going to be playing altered scale harmony. It's just chord tones maybe with a two or, you mm. know, so on and so forth. This is actually a re- it's a funny thing about jazz education. It's actually a really good tune to start visualizing the fretboard on because if you think about the process you would go through, just play root notes. Okay, I'm going to play B, then D, then G, then B flat, then E flat. 
if you've got the chart in front of you, you don't even have to remember it. Then if you're just going to play roots and thirds, then just roots and fifths and roots and sevenths. This is a really good starting point. The problem with this tune is it's played like, you know. That's the problem with this tune. That's why it's considered to be very difficult. Mm. With yeah. all that said, I agree with you entirely. Um, I would just say that the barrier to entry for me to enjoy playing over it would be, you, I think you absolutely have to have worked a little bit on two five ones. Uh, Again, because I think there are so the, many of them. I mean, I think we're maybe talking three about... Of them. I think we might be talking about... Oh, sorry, Dad, sorry, Jake. Two yeah. different things, like slightly two different things. Not like a big... I think someone could get a lot of, out of this as an intellectual beginner exercise but to enjoy playing over it yeah, to make yeah. music i think there's a little bit i mean again this would as i hear myself saying that this would count for anything but i think there is a particular difficulty with giant steps even at slow tempos because it never settles your brain never really gets to turn off this again just brings me to a a point that i feel i, I have to make here which is that what giant steps does is it's a useful tool because it is a a, a very much like a ph stick of a reality check as to what you're capable of doing you can you can have a student who's not been playing very long and ask them to play over autumn leaves and they'll do it and they can get a false sense of where they're at because they're not really playing the changes they're not really mapping out the harmony in their mind what they're doing is they're sort of playing around the key and using their ears and using their ears but with giant steps if you are looking at it from the student's perspective Yes, it's an intellectual exercise, but it's a highly honest intellectual exercise because you cannot get away. Well, it brings us back to what I was talking about at the beginning, isn't it? Yeah. That's the same thing, is exactly. that you can't fudge that with in no. the way that you can't square that circle of, okay, I'm going to take this whatever type rhythm changes, blues, whatever, the, all the standard cutting that Dan was talking about, progressions, and then just... It's just, just like punch through regardless. There's an old joke about, you know, was it on the sort of memes about B flat blues over everything? It's like you can't do that. And it is an exercise. So I think you guys are perhaps talking about different musical pursuits there. Tommy talking about an, a very, very important. Yeah, that's fair. Intellectual or, you know, controlling exercise about understanding and how to find things. And Jake, I think you might be talking about more having a musical experience. Yeah, there's the two not things disagreement. Can... There's not Sorry? disagreement. There's not disagreement between us, is what I mean to say. Right. No, I mean the thing there's is, no coral here. The, the, <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. I mean, it's, it depends what you mean by musical experience. If what you mean is that you didn't feel like you were defeated, okay, well that's a slightly more musical experience. But you're not really playing jazz when you're playing over autumn leaves and you're not mapping out the changes. You're not really doing it. So is it really more statement. musically? I'm not is I mean, it well you're I not mean, really playing you're not really playing jazz you're just playing over the changes i mean if you were to we talked about vocabulary last week if you if you're playing jazz you should be you know according, apparently you should be playing the vocabulary you should be playing and mapping out the changes if what you're doing is you're floating around the key center i think it's easy to convince yourself that you are playing the genre but then, of course, you're not because you're not then able to transfer what the skill set you think you're doing is to either a key change or to another slightly more perceived difficult tune. Whereas if you were actually mapping the harmony out on the fretboard in the way that you were supposed to be doing, you would be able to do that. You would be able to play giant steps or you would be able to play, you would be able to change the key and do it immediately. So it's it's sort of, I think you have to be very honest about what are you achieving by this is why i think giant steps is so good because it, it it forces you to really work on that essential core skill that for some reason is pushed further down the line it's like no giant steps is too hard play this blues because if you play this blues you can play a bit of minor pentatonic and the chords that you know you can outline the other ones just play the minor pentatonic. do the work for you yeah it's not it's not it's not really identifying where the issue is with you playing yeah. and i think that's why giant steps appealed so much to me but I think you there's a there's like a meta or a kind of a um, a qualitative argument about what is a musical experience in this sense. So I would agree with you on this very much so. But I can see why somebody might say, as an educator, like say, okay, well, um, it's going to be more like an onboarding ramp of just getting someone to play some mind pentatonic over something, and that is the 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 most important thing of all. 
about being able to play the style or within the genre. Now, I, I think that this, from a guitar perspective, far too many people rely on that overly to the point where they then can't do things and have that full sense of achievement. And this has absolutely happened within my experience of teaching in my own life, I guess, and in previous decades. But certainly now where you're right, you can get somebody who can be quite confidently... Um, playing through a, a couple of tunes in a very specific key and having some vocabulary even and, um, m you know, playing with some feel. But then if you change the key or if you put a different set of changes, that can, the rug can be completely pulled un from under their feet. And I think that to me is one of the things that what Tom's talking about this tune would do is that it primes your core minimal skill sets. If you can, if you can hold on to those, if you can, you know, hold hold on to the the rails and make those <laughs> tiny. Uh, <laughs> Man, I don't think I don't think I could play it in another key. <laughs> it's really that's bad. Really right? yeah. I don't think I could. That's really yeah. It's really interesting because that's what we're talking about last week. Is that I I'm pretty much I I, I could play it if good or bad. It'd be kind of re relatively the same in most keys. Yeah, the key. Give, give, uh, this this is just just a statement. You know, it's not. I'm not trying to make a comparison here, but the key is irrelevant to me. I think it's maybe got something to do with the tuning, but um, that's the way I've learned to play over this stuff. is is so localized and so vertical that the key is just totally irrelevant. So I do, I do find we need to sit down and have a chat about that at some point because I find that very interesting because it came up last week as well. Yeah. Mm. Guys, man, it's one hour 15. I think we've, uh, have we exhausted Giant Steps? No, you can never exhaust Giant Steps. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get some questions on it in the, the group. So we might save some for a bonus episode, maybe. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's let's hear your takes, guys. Even, you know, slow or fast, whatever. Yeah, yeah, let's should, do it. Let's, should you learn it? Should you, you put know? it? <laughs> learn it, just do it. Tom says learn it. BB says learn it. Dan says? Uh, yeah, I would say, I would say, Learn it. It depends on your reasoning, but, um, you know, yeah. Jake? Relax. Don't do it <laughs> when you go out of Coltrane it. No, I do. Um, it's, it's why not, but learn other things first. Don't, don't, don't jump. Don't, don't, it's just general advice. Don't jump ahead too much because you'll just disappoint yourself. Reach for the stars and hit a tree, sure. But <laughs> if you, if like, you... be, be, be very careful. I think that was S Club, not Steps. <laughs> yeah. Giant, Giant S Club. S -Club. Ah. Ah. And I think that must be uh, Dan's um, uh, safe, safe word, word this week. <laughs> Giant <laughs> S Clubs. Uh, I think if you're into the sort of fretboard mastery thing, uh, I think, yeah, I think this is a, a great, great vehicle. It's probably, I don't think you could ever tire of... Um, uh, of using it for that kind of that kind of thing. I think I think my final statement on this would be um, final final statement. Sorry, sorry. Uh, don't, for want of a better term, diminish this tune to just being an egotistical statement. There's a lot more to it than that. There are no diminished chords in it, Tom. I know I shouldn't have said it that, but you know what I mean. Only I, learn I, it so you can shit on the jazz noobs. Yeah, and there and also go. when you're when you're working on it, just keep it really quiet. Like, don't tell anyone about it. Just shocking, you know, shocking giant because steps. It, because it's a bit weird. It's like if you if you're a bit zealous about yeah, guys, I've been working on giant steps the whole time this week. Yeah, it's, it's all uh, you've been talking about. Recently, I know, Jake. I know, but I, I feel like I've got my badge that it says it's okay, guys. I've done other things. <laughs> Could you boy next you next Coltrane album's Matrix. Be, <laughs> next album's going to be nothing but Coltrane changes. <laughs> Coltrane guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't know, this is a uh, a very niche British comedy reference. There's been a fair bit of niche British yeah. references <laughs> Look today. Up, uh, Bob Mortimer on Twitter. He's got a char character called Train Guy, oh. which uh, which I reference. It's got nothing to do with blowing down a horn either. <laughs> yeah. Ah, Train Horn. Right. Let's uh, close this one out then. Um, thank you all for joining me. I've thoroughly enjoyed that one. Um, I'm going to enjoy editing it even more, I think. Um, again, to hear all the little bits that I that get <laughs> miss out when we're talking over one another. And um, yeah, all that's left to do is to give a huge thanks to our executive producer patrons. Well, all of our patrons, but specifically I'm going to read out now all of you executive producer plus guys that help us make the show. And um, 
Yeah, keep the lights on. So we have Alan Dela Cruz, Andy French, Dave Cookson, David Kisselbau, Elliot DeVries, James Wendt, Drew Popek, Jonathan Murrell, Mark Lee, Martin Mason, Matt Burtwistle, Maxime Kaczynski, Michael Norris, Michael Smith, Mike Patty, Nick Gondlich, Nico A. Kessnorton, Taylor, Paskin794, Pat John, Robert S. Leher, Sam Oxley, Sam Whiting, Tim Bennett, Ulf Schwarak, Volkember, Kirdan, and Will Pusey. Thank you guys for... <laughs> uh, it's descended into... Um, <laughs> practical humour on the Zoom call here. I'm not sure what Tom's up to. He's looking a bit odd. It's not, it's not just uh, me. <laughs> all three of you. <laughs> yeah, we all t- while he was reading the list, we all turned our glasses upside down. To oh, you guys. <laughs> I'm not Lockdown's very player. boring. Um, you're not going to derail this housekeeping, so I'm just now going to say, for just $1 a week, you can support us on Patreon and get access to all the extra minutes, all the bonus episodes, all the video live streams and that like good stuff. Um, check out our T-shirts, our merchandise over in Teespring. We've got some mugs, stickers. Um, follow us on Instagram. As we were saying earlier, we're now doing a YouTube channel, so we're going to put all the, all the audio episodes up onto the YouTube channel. Um, what else is there left to say? I think that's all. Email hello at theguitarhour.com and join in the discussion. Come and tell us what you think of this episode and post your takes on Giant Steps into the Facebook discussion group um, or on Instagram and tag us if you want to just do a hot minute of it. And um, I think, yeah, we're all done. Speak to you next week, guys. Bye. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye.